Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Brown Snyder, a physician and holistic adult and child psychiatrist. In today's episode, I'll be talking about mold toxicity, and I want to give a fairly concise overview of this very common cause of brain-related symptoms. So I'll talk about what mold toxicity is, what conditions and symptoms it can cause, especially psychiatric and brain-related conditions. I'll talk about how we diagnose and assess mold toxicity, how we have someone assess their environment for water damage and mold. I'll discuss treatment interventions. So though mold-related illness is often associated with respiratory symptoms, it is absolutely a common cause of brain-related symptoms, and I see this regularly in my practice when I check for mold toxins for people that have brain symptoms and see people's brain symptoms improving as these mold toxins leave their body and or as they're addressed for colonization of mold in their body. Common respiratory symptoms could be sinus infections, asthma, even in young children, ear infections. However, the brain-related symptoms run the full gamut, and someone does not have to have respiratory symptoms in order to have brain-related symptoms. So those could be problems with brain fog, fatigue, problems with depression, anxiety, it can even cause depersonalization where people feel like they're outside of themselves or derealization where their environment doesn't feel real. In psychosis, mood swings, it can also be a contributor and one of the root causes for those on the autism spectrum as well as those with ADHD and other developmental disorders and for those with cognitive decline and dementia, as well as Parkinson's. Beyond psychiatric and the respiratory symptoms that I mentioned, there can be some neurologic type symptoms, numbness, tingling. Some people will feel a vibration sense or a spark-like uh, jolting pain in their body. Uh, that These symptoms don't happen for everyone. Some people will have problems with temperature dysregulation, so they feel very cold when it's not cold or very hot when it's not hot. Some people will have GI symptoms, shortness of breath or what we call air hunger, high immune reactivity, again, often in the form of what we call mast cell activation is very common. And mast cell activation has a whole range of symptoms. Um, and that could be involving the skin, GI tract, respiratory system. There can be brain-related symptoms, bladder symptoms. So there are many mechanisms when it comes to impacts on the brain. Some of these are more direct and some of these are more indirect through um, an overactive immune system, through elevated pyrroles, through limbic system dysfunction through autonomic nervous system dysfunction and nutrient imbalances, impacts on methylation, and the list goes on. How might we get mold toxicity? Uh, it's important to note that we can actually come into the world with mold toxicity. It does cross, mold toxins do cross the placenta. However, for most people, they are likely acquiring them within water damaged environments. And where there's water damage or retained moisture in a structure or building, there will be mold growth. And it's these particular molds that are especially toxic. Outdoor molds, where there's checks and balances, those molds are not necessarily spewing off the toxins in the way that molds present in a contained moist space do. Most of those sources are through inhalation and that can be inhalation of the toxins and or the spores. This could be in our homes, it could be in our workspace, it absolutely could be in school settings, in dormitories, in daycare, it can also be in cars that have 
some degree of water damage or if a window was left open. And it could even be a mattress in which there was bedwetting. Retain moisture in a contained space will grow mold. Not everyone, however, seems to be susceptible. Most people can mount an immune response to mold toxins. That doesn't mean if they don't if that doesn't mean that if they get a large enough exposure, they won't develop toxicity. However, at more typical levels, they usually can manage that and don't become toxic. It appears that 25% of people can't mount an immune response. There does appear to be some genetic vulnerabilities here. And so within a household or a single environment, not everyone will become sick. But in a large office building, in a large school setting, a number of people will be affected, and I would say uh, usually unknowingly affected. The mold toxins can go to the liver, where they're put into the gallbladder, bound to bile salts, and put in the gastrointestinal tract. Well, bile salts are reabsorbed, and so with that will be a reabsorption of mold toxins. So there is this circular pattern, and for those who can't mount an immune response, they can uh, maintain that toxicity. There's mold allergy, and that's where people have an immune, re immune response to mold in their environment. But these are very different. Someone could have mold toxicity and not necessarily have mold allergy. Then there's mold colonization. And this is where there's a presence of mold. While we may have candida in our gastrointestinal tract as a norm, um, and it can overgrow because of things like antibiotics, mold shouldn't be there. However, mold can colonize the sinuses and the respiratory tract and can seed the gastrointestinal tract. And then that can become a source of toxicity even when someone's out of an environment where they're getting exposed. So again, someone can retain the mold toxins, but some people, and I would say many of the adults that I see, appear to be colonized, meaning they have um, mold in their body and a source of toxicity. So how do we diagnose mold toxicity? Uh, what I do in my evaluations is certainly I always ask, because again, it's so common with brain-related symptoms, I always ask about um, exposure to water damage, and this could be stains on the ceiling, uh, windows that show damage, it could be a roof leak, it could be water intrusion that comes near uh, entry for a fireplace, it could be a damp basement, it could, uh, it could be a dorm room, they're notorious for having mold. And I've seen many young people go off to college fine and developmental health issues in college and uh, found they had mold toxicity. Also school settings, very common if you look, there will be stains on the uh, ceiling tiles from uh, leaks in the pipes and also be important to know someone's timeline when did they have known exposure and when were the onset of their symptoms now it doesn't always fall out such that someone has exposures and then their symptoms started sometimes people have had exposures over time and their symptoms sort of escalated with that Sometimes people come into the world with mold toxicity and as young children had ear infections and high immune reactivity, maybe they had croup or asthma, and that could have been the beginning of their um, evidencing mold toxicity, but then maybe it wasn't diagnosed until later in life. Aside from history and timeline and symptoms, we also do what's called urine mycotoxin testing. Uh, the one that I use is the real-time mycotoxin test, and this measures for five toxins, ochratoxin, aflatoxin, trichothecenes, gliotoxin, which is made by mold and candida, or yeast, and xeralanone. And though those aren't all the toxins, that gives a pretty good picture of if someone has mold toxicity. And we do have people uh, assess their environment once we know someone has mold toxicity and we know they're susceptible. 
even if they think it's related to an old exposure, we do want them to make sure that their current environment doesn't have mold. The test that I recommend is the ERMI test. I like mycometrics. Another test that's less expensive would be using agar plates. Immunolytics is a test that does those. Now, if someone knows they have a source of water damage, I don't find that testing particularly useful because where there's water retained in a space, there will be uh, toxic mold. So I don't recommend people spending their money as much as having that water damage source addressed in a proper way with containment and appropriate remediation. Air sampling is something that many um, mold inspectors will use. I have lived in many homes and I've had many homes tested for mold and I have consistently not found air sampling to be helpful. Let's talk about treatment. There are really four aspects of treatment that I think about. The first is making sure that someone's not getting exposed. And I talked about how someone can test their environment there's also the importance of using air purification and lowering the humidity in one's home. You can get a hygrometer and check the humidity in your home. You want it to be in the low 50s or below. Treatment does involve to start, if someone is able, and most people are, to start binders. When we identify the toxins that are present on the test, we use specific targeted binders for those toxins and we work in one binder at a time starting low and slow building it up um, not necessarily to the maximum but have people identify where the dose works for them once someone is on appropriate binders if they're having a significant benefit and most people will benefit week to week and have improvement but if they're having a really dramatic improvement that would suggest they're probably not colonized and we would simply retest it um, somewhere between three and six months. They would stay on binders during that time. Once someone's on the binders, then we would be um, looking to start antifungal treatment, again, unless they have a dramatic response. And the antifungal treatment could be starting with treating candida in the GI tract. Many people have candida overgrowth uh, along with mold toxicity. Some people, more of their symptoms are in their sinuses, and we might start with nasal sprays, uh, antifungal nasal sprays, and then for either the GI tract or the sinuses, we may use um, biofilm disruptors, things to break down the protective coverings that the microbes can make. We will at times use systemic antifungals, which go into the bloodstream. The other piece that is important Thirdly would be diet. So if someone's colonized with candida in the GI tract or mold in the GI tract or sinuses, they may be feeding those microbes if they're getting sugar or a relatively high carbohydrate diet, which is the norm in our Western culture. So there are dietary recommendations that really eliminate sugar, bring down carbs, and take out foods that have trace amounts of mold that could be uh, triggering the immune system, things like corn or potatoes or dried fruit, just to give some examples, vinegar. But the biggest piece, I would say, is really bringing down the carbs. Many people do well on a paleo-type diet that's not heavy in fruit. There are individuals who are highly sensitive because of that mast cell activation um, or because of that autonomic or limbic system dysfunction. And it's very difficult for them to put anything in their body. And for those individuals, we would have them spend a good eight weeks often doing limbic system retraining, doing vagal nerve interventions, really to get them to a place where their body will feel safe enough to sort of accept binders or accept mast cell interventions, mast cell stabilizers. What I'd like to do in the next episode is highlight some of the research on old toxicity in um, psychiatric conditions and what's being learned in research, even though it hasn't been translated yet into medical schools and conventional medicine. 
And I also want to look at the question of, is there mold in the brain? I've talked about mold being in the sinuses and GI, GI tract, but is, this, is it possible that mold is actually, for some people, getting in the brain? And I don't mean people who are immunocompromised, who are known to have significant fungal infections. If you'd like to receive these in your mailbox each week and you don't already, you can subscribe at CourtneySnyderMD.com. I also, as always, welcome any comments or questions. If you are interested in my practice where I provide treatment, but also non-patient consultations nationally and internationally, I have information about that there as well as the mentoring groups that I provide. Thanks for listening. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.